Hey, Katie, how's it going? Hey, Jesse, pretty good. Although I walked in on my wife doing something disturbing yesterday. This sounds like a good story to share with everybody. Yeah, so I walked into into the bedroom and she was on her phone and I said, like, what are you doing? And she said, oh, I'm I'm signing up to, to donate to the blocked and reported Patreon. Nice. No, <laughs> Jesse, this is my money. <laughs> <laughs> I asked her, I was like, please just Venmo me $5 a month if you feel like you need to donate. She totally refused. So she joined the Patreon. Thankfully, she did it at the lowest tier. So it's not going to cost me too much. Thank you. Is this really the message we want to be sending to our listeners that you got mad when your wife donated? To our it's just that I don't want to share it with you. It's fine if she wants to donate to my right. half of the podcast. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, I think she was actually maybe the donor who crossed this over to a uh, $1,000 a month. Yeah. Well, thank you very much to Jana. Uh, she's also bought my iced coffee today, effectively. So we really appreciate that. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell her. Katie, what is the name of this podcast we are endeavoring to record? This is Blocked and Reported, the only podcast about the internet, and I'm Katie Herzog. I'm Jesse Single, and this week we're going to be talking about a pair of controversies involving very- Wait, wait, do, oh, sorry. Wait, do you hear that? Oh, fuck. Oh, man. Katie, I, I set up an alarm to go off whenever we had to continue talking about the Chrissy T and Allison Roman thing. Um Oh, I, the alarm has gone off. Yeah, I apologize, but I think we don't really have another choice. We we do whatever the alarm tells us to do. Um, so what? Let me see. Let me look what happened. This is me definitely typing, not pretending to type. Oh wow. Okay, so it says Allison Roman's Times food column is temporarily suspended. Do you, do you have any idea what's going on here? What has Allison Roman been canceled? She appears to have been at least partially canceled. Uh, and listeners will know the basics of this controversy. Allison Roman uh, talked some smack about Chrissy Teigen, led to a whole blow up. Consult our back catalog. Now the Times appears to have suspended her, although there's some ambiguity here because the Times spokesperson told uh, Daily Beast just that she was suspended um, temporarily or just that her calm was on temporary leave. No, no details. What do you think about this, Katie? I mean, I, I guess maybe the shallot pasta isn't that good after all. I can't imagine what else it would be that would, uh, would, would lead to the times discontinuing this, um, this incredibly popular column. It, surely it could not be that she could, that she criticized Christy Teigen. No, absolutely not. Yeah. I think what happened was one of her editors finally made the pasta and was like, American cheese and mayonnaise and pasta? That, that doesn't make any sense. Karen. <laughs> you know, I tried to make the shallot pasta and it wasn't good. So I'm blaming her for the recipe and not my lack of cooking skills. Oh, it was actually bad. I didn't try to make it. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> is there anything else we could possibly say about Allison Roman and Chrissy Teigen? I mean, this is just, I don't, I really want to know the backstory here, but there is no um, actual reporting on why her column was suspended. Some people suggested maybe she took a self-imposed leave, but why wouldn't the Times have, have made that clear? Right, right. Yeah. And I, I saw on Twitter that Chrissy Teigen was um, apparently is not happy about this development. So I don't think we can we can really blame Chrissy for the for the cancellation of Alison Roman. This could be self-cancellation for all we know. Yeah, this is, um, it's not great. Well, now that that's out of the way, uh, Jesse, what are we talking about today? Yeah. I mean, we should acknowledge that at any point that Chrissy Teigen and Alison Roman alarm could go off. And if it does, we'll have to talk about this more. But for now, we're going to talk about a pair of controversies involving very young, very successful journalists, Ronan Farrow and Gia Tolentino. But first, we're going to jump into an international conspiracy of lesbians. I can only assume this is an international conspiracy of lesbians you are a part of, Katie. I mean, obviously, I'm a lesbian and I'm international, so... Very excited about that. A little bit of housekeeping first. As Katie mentioned, our Patreon is up, patreon.com slash blocked and reported. The response so far has been amazing. We launched this thing, um, I think a week and a half ago. And it's just, you know, it's we're excited about where it's going. We have a lot of great stuff planned for you. Please donate if you can. If you can't, please just continue to listen to the free ones, which will continue popping into your feed every week. Always contact us, blocked and reported podcast at gmail.com, Twitter at the bar pod. Continue to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. Am I missing anything housekeeping-wise, Katie? Mm, not that it comes to mind. Okay, so let's get into this international conspiracy of lesbians, which I can only imagine will be quite tawdry. There's a website called Pink News that hopefully most of our listeners are unaware of. I, 
what would you call it? It's like sort of an LGBT lefty tabloid. Yeah. So this was started as apparently uh, like the free paper in London's like gay community years ago. I doubt there's still a print version, um, but it was just sort of like a weekly gay rag. Um, and it has transitioned, I would say, over the years to become basically a trans rag. Gotcha. And this story caught our eye last week or earlier this week. There's no concept of time anymore. The headline, the gender critical feminist movement is a cult that grooms, controls, and abuses according to a lesbian who managed to escape. Hard to read that out loud without laughing a little bit. I guess the main context reader listeners will need to know here is like the whole thing about uh, TERFs and gender critical feminists. So a TERF is a trans exclusionary radical feminist. And do you think it's safe to say they're sort of among sort of mainstream progressive pro LGBT people, hardly anyone is as hated as a TERF right now, right? TERFs are not popular. No. People who are called TERFs often argue that the term TERF is a slur, which I don't entirely agree with, but you often see slogans, th- hashtags, things like written on papers and held up at Pride that say things like kill TERFs. Um, so this is definitely not a not not a, a label given with um with love there are raging online culture wars and culture wars in certain areas of, of academia and activism about turfs basically trying to figure out who's a turf trying to expose him you and i have both been called turfs it doesn't actually take that much to get called a turf um jk rowling is often now considered a turf because she apparently likes some turfy tweets and made some statement about how like biological sex is real yeah it's um it's a pretty low bar and and a segment of progressive activism is really fixated on TERFs, which in terms of their real world power is a little bit strange because like the sorts of people where you could maybe fairly apply the label tend to be like left wing philosophers and academics. Like they tend to be philosophers or sociologists, just not not people we would usually consider to be particularly influential, right? Right. And they are often deplatformed, um, kicked out of their social networks, that kind of thing. So uh, no, I would not say that this group has a, a great amount of cultural power. Right. So, okay. And then there's the gender critical movement is more or less philosophers who think gender is a construct. And they often believe that you can't really change your sex in the way some LGBT activists say you can. And they're often skeptical of things like self ID or the idea that to legally change my sex, I can just go to, um, you know, a judge or some official and, and say, I am now a man or now a woman. And, and there's a very complicated controversy in the UK over what that process should look like. But gender critical feminists are the ones who are, are basically pushing back and saying it shouldn't be that easy. Is, is that correct in your understanding? Yeah. And what's happening in the in the UK is interesting because so there is this in 2018, sort of ironically, the Conservative Party um, proposed this this Gender Recognition Act that would change the process from legally transitioning to basically self, self ID. So if you said, you know, I'm a woman, you're a woman, and then you would be permitted in, into like historically female only spaces, prisons, locker rooms, things like that. And so this was explained to me by a gender critical feminist in the UK. And 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 so what she told me was that when this was pitched, so can, remember, this is pitched by the Conservative Party, which is not the equivalent of Republicans in the US, but it is historically a, a more like socially conservative group of people. And so this was pitched after the success of, of gay marriage and gay marriage was wildly popular. And so it, they sort of thought it was going to be like a slam dunk way to, to gain some public support. And what happened was the exact opposite. So what they thought was going to be minor, normally, I guess, when they have these these sort of acts that would change, you know, change law, like you'll hear there'll be a public comment period and you'll hear from just the people who are involved. So if there's, um, you know, some act that's going to outlaw circumcision or something like that, you would hear from proponents of circumcision, maybe, maybe like the Jews. You'd hear from me for sure. Yeah, you would hear from, from the Jews. Um, and <laughs> especially Jesse Sinkle, huge fan of, of cutting the tips off of infant penises. And so what happened is instead of this being sort of a minor issue that they only heard from trans people, they heard from everybody. There were like something like 100,000 public comments over this, um, over this issue, most of them negative. 
And so what happened is that this issue that really went from being something that would like trans people and gender critical feminist were arguing over amongst themselves ended up becoming this giant national story. Right. And it did sort of create these uh, this situation where you have strange bedfellows because all of a sudden it wasn't just gender critical feminists who were pushing out back against self ID and the Gender Recognition Act. It was also conservatives. It was, you know, Catholics. It was fundamentalist. And these groups don't actually get along in most respects. And so there's tons and tons of infighting in this uh, within this within this sort of larger coalition. Lots of fracturing over the past couple of months there's been like if you if you sort of follow these groups on Twitter, you can see this sort of infighting just like get hotter and hotter and hotter and it seems like these groups are totally splintering apart. So it's been very fascinating to watch and it also reminds me um why I would never join a movement. <laughs> yeah, movements are terrible except the block you reported our army. Which is what we're <laughs> Um, well, the other interesting thing is like it's this this matter of public policy and the way it's been covered, especially in American media. You look at um, the New York Times or BuzzFeed outlets, various outlets. There's there's actual debate about what the best policy should be. Like I'm in reading about the process trans people in the UK have to go through to transition. I'm sympathetic to the idea that it's too onerous. Like you don't you don't want it to be impossible. And there's this history of trans people having to like live as their preferred or felt gender for years before they can transition. I don't think a lot of people are in favor of that. But there's this idea that unless you agree with the sort of most uh, assertive version of the reform, which would really just make it self-ID, you're a transphobe, you're a turf, you're gender critical. And it's made for just a really toxic discussion. I've been surprised at at how poorly this has been covered in the mainstream media. And, And part of that has just been this sort of real fixation on turfs to the point where you have like big article in Vox, multiple articles in the New York Times, just about TERFs, about this fairly small marginal group of of left-wing academics and philosophers and, and activists. And it's just, it just, the TERFs in general are not the reason trans people face oppression in the US. That is mostly Republicans and conservative lawmakers. And it's just the sort of social dynamics that have led this to be such a fixation are very interesting to me. Yeah. And the coverage in the UK press is entirely different. I have a very hard time imagining um, in 2020 that you would see a piece critical of sort of the uh, more extreme versions of, of trans activism, whereas you do see this in the UK press, major newspapers, even sometimes including The Guardian, have published op or published opinion pieces Um critical of this act and and uh, that's because it's there you know they like they're they're more involved in the nuance they see what's actually happening but you just would never see that in the u.s press no the u.s is just sort of rolled over the u.s press has rolled over on this issue and it's an interesting issue and i yeah i i it's been frustrating to watch so this has all been background for this um very crazy story in pick news which the story is about a woman named amy Dias. She's she's a lesbian who said she was part of the gender critical movement and that she escaped and that it was like a cult. And I'll just um I'll read a little bit of from this article, which we'll also link to so so you guys can get a sense of of its craziness. Amy, who is based in Seattle, doesn't believe those things anymore, you know, about gender critical feminism being good. Looking back on her time in the gender critical feminist movement, she is unequivocal. It's a cult. A cult that groomed her when she was vulnerable and sleeping in her car, a cult that sought to control her keeping tabs on her movements and dictating what she could and couldn't say, a cult that was emotionally and sexually abusive towards her. Now, Katie, you actually got in touch with some of the people involved in this story. And if my understanding is correct, you confirmed every detail and there is an international conspiracy of sexually abusive lesbians. Absolutely. Yes, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm applying for membership this week. Yeah. So th- this article, um, this interview in Pick News that was, I believe, written by someone named Vic Parsons, um, it doesn't name the the people Amy is accusing of being involved in this conspiracy. At one point, she says that someone promised her a wife. <laughs> I was promised a wife. It's it's very funny. She accuses a lot of people in this movement, a movement that is that is dominated by lesbians of being homophobic, and she doesn't name her, uh, you know, her victimizers. But she has in the past called these people out specifically by name. And so the the main person she's accusing here is Julie Bendel, who we've talked about in the podcast before. And Julie's a UK feminist. I know her a little bit. So I got in touch with Julie and I asked her sort of her version of events. And I'm not going to go into details here, but let's just like suffice it to say there's just like interpersonal drama. It's just sort of infighting. Um, and it's not very important. But the important thing to know is that Julie did not ever traffic anybody. She's actually like she spent most of her career 
like <laughs> as like a human rights advocate working primarily for women who've been trafficked and abused and otherwise served by the world. Right. Part of what makes t- turf dif- discourse so amazing is obviously you obviously you often can't tell someone's evil just by looking at them, but the positions and acts attributed to so-called TERFs. And then you you look at them and they're mostly middle-aged lesbians who are longtime feminist campaigners. It just doesn't always fit intuitively. Right, right. So I got in touch with Amy and I asked her if I could see the receipts because she said that she has like direct evidence that Julie Bendel and these other people were like manipulating her and, and you know... <laughs> abusing her um sexually abusing her from um from across an ocean and she did not give me the receipts but this is the the message that i got back from her i said um hey could you send me the screenshots of the dms thanks and she responds no that's for stories you understand that's exclusive content (sighs) okay so right so i have to say i feel a little bit bad for amy because i think that she maybe misinterpreted some things that were said to her, or she's a little bit deranged, and and I and I mean that, and I say that with kindness. I think that she might she might be troubled, um, and so I, I feel bad for her because I think that she has been taken advantage of this paper. Um, so I got in touch with Vic Parsons too, and I asked Vic if if Amy shared the the receipts with him. And he wrote me back and he said, yes. Um, once again, I have not seen these D- DMs because um, Amy refuses to share them. And then uh, I wrote back and I said, you know, th- thanks for the response. Um, can you tell me why you didn't name Julie Bendel directly in this piece? And I didn't hear back. And my assumption is that Vic and Pink News decided not to directly name name Julie because the UK has very strict defamation laws and they've written about her a bunch. So th- these people are not afraid to criticize Julie Bindle. This was definitely not to save Julie Bindle's feelings or anything like that. I really, the only ima- reason I can imagine them doing this is because at some level they knew that Julie could pursue legal action. The, the whole story is like very deranged. And so the interesting thing about it is that if you, if you follow these sort of groups of people online and you read this piece, you would know that it was deranged. And so after this was published, it became a joke. It became this sort of widespread, you know, meta joke on Twitter, on gender critical turf Twitter or whatever. But if you looked at the responses after Amy posted it on Twitter, it's mostly from people, or at least the first day that I looked, she has since blocked me. <laughs> she accused me of being in the cult and then blocked me. Um, so it's mostly people who support her, right? So lots of trans people who either believe it or are pretending to believe it, even though they know that these claims are ridiculous. So that's the problem with this. It's like, if you are well-versed in this discourse, you know that these allegations are insane. If you're not, and you read this in a publication, even a publication like Pink News, you're going to come away with this thinking there really is an international cabal of lesbians who are abusing like young dykes. Yeah, I guess, I guess what frustrated me about it was, look, I, I don't know anything about this this purported victim, but in normal circumstances, if someone came to you and said, I'm being controlled and manipulated by an international conspiracy of lesbians – you would think that they might be going through some stuff. They might be troubled. And I think you and I both know that, especially online, there is no shortage of people who are screaming out into the void that so-and-so has abused them or harassed them. I mean, I've been accused of of crazy stuff. There's just like, there's a market for this kind of thing. So, you know, none of which is to say this person wasn't wronged in some way. We don't know the details, but just for an outlet, even an outlet with the standards of pink news to pick this up and run with it and to run with it, without naming anyone, without any details, uh, you know, parts of the story will be like, she was sexually abused. And then it doesn't explain that at all. It's just a bizarre story. I was very surprised to see it published. Right. I mean, just there's no corroboration at all. And so, you know, the fact that they that they that they published this and apparently with no consideration for the alleged victim of these crimes as, as well and what this was going to do to her is just so irresponsible. I mean, not to mention what it does to the people that she's actually, you know, accusing this of. Yeah. Well, that actually raises a question. So let's just say hypothetically tomorrow you wake up and you're the head of a international lesbian conspiracy. And you're the most powerful figure in it, so you can really do whatever you want. What's your What's your first day agenda? I tell everyone to donate to the Blocked and Reported Patreon. 
that's exactly the right answer. I'm glad you thought about that. I have, you know, I have always sort of dreamed of being a cult leader. Um, I don't think I'd be particularly good at, at it because I have sort of an anti-authoritarian streak in me and I don't really, I don't really pr- particularly trust people who are leaders of anything. But, you know, if we woke up tomorrow and people want to join my cult, I, you know, we can try it out. The way to do it, is, have you seen Wild Wild Country? I have, yes. So that cult or movement or whatever it is, <laughs> The main guy, like, just sort of basked in all the attention and drugs and women or whatever. Then you need a really powerful, organized second in command. I think that's the way to do it. Would you like to be my second in command? No, because I'm not. <laughs> I, I'm not organized at all. I'd be the shittiest cult leader. Come on. All right, fine. Well, we're uh, accepting applications. Um, email blocked and reported at gmail dot com if you would like to um to to be my lieutenant. Can you can you believe we just got like a ten minute segment out of a pink news article? <laughs> You know what? It might not be the last time that it happens. The pink news is just rife with just shit to talk about. The whole and the whole like turf wars and gender critical wars is all really fascinating. And I mean, it's fascinating. and It's horrible. And I think we will inevitably return to it because because God hates us, basically. Because we're turfs. Well, you're you're a turf. I'm a chaser. (laughs) Okay, moving on. Okay, now that we have uh, now that we've resolved the turf wars, Katie, you wanted to talk about this whole Ronan Farrow thing, right? Right. So uh, you're familiar with Ronan Farrow, I take it. I am viciously jealous of him, as are we all. Oh my god, how could you not be? I mean, he's attractive, he's rich, he is fucking younger than me by a significant amount, and he is far more successful than any of us will ever be. Okay, so recently Ben Smith, the newly appointed media critic at the New York Times, who was formerly um, the news editor at BuzzFeed, published a piece in the Times called, Is Ronan Farrow Too Good to Be True? I've been waiting for this, Jesse. <sighs> this, when this came across the transom, I was so fucking excited. Okay, so there's been a lot of discussion about this particular piece, but... And I don't want to go too into the nitty gritty details because people can read it on their own and the details aren't actually that interesting. But suffice it to say, Ronan Farrow, who is one of the people who broke the Weinstein, uh, the Weinstein story, he of, for which he later won a Pulitzer along with um, two reporters from the New York Times, Jody Cantor and Megan Toomey. Uh, he also wrote a book called um, Catch and Kill, which is all about his reporting out of that story and how Harvey Weinstein's people hired like ex Assad agents to track him or whatever. So it's sort of a, a, a thriller about his reporting. Um, so Ronan Farrow, boy wonder, who uh, graduated from Bard at like 15, is perfect or seemingly was perfect until last week. So Ben Smith basically did some fact checking of Ronan Farrow's work and what he found was that Pharaoh had failed to corroborate or had misconstrued or misinterpreted some like pretty significant things. So what I found the most interesting thing about this piece was uh, the section about Matt Lauer. So Matt Lauer, of course, formerly the, the host of the, of the Today Show on NBC, um, was, uh, was Me too during sort of the, the height of the Me Too movement. He was accused of, of harassment, um, of having... Uh, affairs with underlings. Um, and he was also accused of rape. And so that's the really big allegation. And he, and he was fired from his show. And he's been sort of, um, I guess, living in purgatory since then, surely unable to work sort of persona non grata um, for obvious reasons. Ben Smith basically pokes some holes in Ronan Farrow's reporting. And then the next day, or maybe two days later, Matt Lauer uh, publishes a piece on Mediaite. Um, so small website, not one that's particularly well known for um, for investigative journalism, but probably the only place where he could get it published. And he extensively documents where Ronan Farrow failed to corroborate allegations against Matt Lauer. And he has them page by page. And what he did was he went back and he talked to all of the people that Ronan Farrow didn't speak to. So uh, this woman who accused of, uh, accused him of rape to Ronan Farrow, and R- Ronan Farrow publishes it in his book, said that after something happened, she immediately went and told her new boyfriend or something like that. Well, Ronan Farrow never went and talked to the new boyfriend, but Matt Lauer did. So he has, I don't know how many, maybe 10 or 12 of these points where he goes back and he fact checks Ronan Farrow. And then this was fact checked by the editors at Mediaite, which is to me what leads credence to it. Um, Because this isn't just Matt Lauer defending himself. This is a third party going back and saying, yeah, Ronan Farrow didn't check these sources. And so you would think that the person here who would be in deep shit would be Ronan Farrow. He won a Pulitzer and he didn't do due diligence. It's totally irresponsible. However, 
The response, at least on Twitter right after this, was a bunch of people, often journalists, saying, basically, we don't want to hear from Matt Lauer, which to me is just insane. Like, Matt Lauer has just poked major fucking holes in this Boy Wonders story, and people are telling him to shut the fuck up. That struck me, like sort of people publicly saying, like, whatever you do, don't read this thing by Matt Lauer. I think the extent of Pharaoh's fuck ups are it's tricky to evaluate because, okay. So for example, to me, the the one I found most compelling was the one about Lauer because Ronan wrote something like, right. She went to her friend and told what happened, but you can't, to me, you can't put that in the book if you haven't checked with the friend that that actually occurred. And it turns out the friend didn't remember any conversation like that. And that, that's a pretty big deal because that's like a major part of the, of the allegation. Now there was a, a piece in Slate by Ashley Feinberg, She's much more sympathetic to Ronan Farrow over Ben Smith. She says, raises the point that, well, you know, Farrow may have corroborated this with other people. But I mean, the version, the the storyline he put in his book wasn't fact checked. And I guess the question is, you know, how many things in the book were fact checked? How rigorous was it? I could definitely like I'm I'm finishing up a book now. I'm about to start my fact checking. I think it's a difficult process and it's easy to fuck up. I just I guess the point here is when it comes to sort of a a big social movement with some moral thrust behind it, it seems like people are less rigorous than usual. And I I do think a lot of journalists, and this is actually going to be a theme in in our last segment too, but a lot of journalists are less than journalistic when it comes to these like big hot button moral issues. So one of the, one of the things Ben Smith does is in his column is he, he calls this a sort of resistance journalism. So I'm going to, I'm going to read a passage from his piece. His work, though, reveals a weakness of a kind of resistance journalism that has thrived in the age of Donald Trump, that if reporters swim ably along with the tides of social media and produce damaging reporting about the pu- about public figures most disliked by the loudest voices, the old rules of fairness and open mindedness can seem more like impediments than essential journalistic imperatives. And I think he gets that exactly right. And I don't know if it's resistance journalism. Someone else called it the problem is superstar journalism. But there's this idea that if the target, if you know that your target is bad, it doesn't matter if you take shortcuts. It doesn't matter if you're a little bit wrong um, because the target deserves it. And we see this over and over and over in journalism today. And it's incredibly frustrating. And it makes me do things like defend people who've done terrible things like Matt Lauer, because the principle should be more important here than, you know, than pegging the guy who everybody fucking hates. Yeah. Okay. So I think, I think Ben Smith was trying to shoehorn a concept he wants to write about into a column where I'm not sure it fits entirely because think of the stories you and I have talked about or in our group DM where there really is this kind of journalism where like, it's just hackish and it's just going after people without giving them a fair shake. These have been stories in places like Jezebel or like some of the coverage of Covington. I don't think Ronan Farrow quite fits that just because he did deliver the goods on a lot of stuff. Like he really showed brought, you know, powerful people down. And I just think like his entire body of reporting, I was disturbed by these like instances where stuff wasn't fully fact checked. But in terms of like that kind of hackish, tabloidish, ruin someone's life for the hell of it journalism, I guess I'm less convinced he fits there. Because like, do you think any of his targets I think that if Matt Lauer didn't rape anybody, he should we should not think of him as a rapist. I, I just don't. I mean I think it I think Oh yeah, no, I'm with you on that completely. Yeah. Yeah, and so Matt Lauer might be a shitbag. He I think it's totally possible that he was a terrible boss, that he abused his power in other ways. But you know if he wasn't a rapist, then I think that the record should report that should reflect that he wasn't a rapist. And there's other things about this story that continue to get repeated. Like after this came out and Matt Lauer made his response, when I looked on Twitter, there's all of these people referring to the quote unquote rape button under his desk, this idea that he had a button he could push that would lock his Crazy. door. Right. So NBC itself debunked that. There was no rape button in his desk. There's apparently it was very common in executive offices to have a button under the desk that would close the door so you don't have to walk across the room and shut the door. But it didn't lock from the inside. It was like a security thing, right? If there was a shooter or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it, it, and it also just like there's no evidence that he used this to abuse anybody. And so I don't think Pharaoh, to his credit, I don't think he printed that in the book, uh, which is good. But that narrative still exists. So there were when I tweeted about this, there are people in my responses saying, but the rape button. Well, here's a fucking paragraph, you know, from from an article where NBC says, no, this like this didn't exist. And people just ignore it. They just double down. And so there was so much of that around the story, just like. Matt Lauer is bad. Ronan Farrow is good. Therefore, we know that, you know, we know who to trust on this story. Yeah. The other thing about Farrow. So, 
So Pharaoh is not trained as a reporter, right? So he started on television. He started as basically a talking head. And then he left NBC. He says over, or I, his, his show on MSNBC was canceled. And then he was working at NBC. Um, and he says that he left because NBC tried to quash his story on Weinstein. Smith brings up some, uh, some maybe conflicting information there as well. Um, and then he went to the New Yorker. So this is not a guy who like started out as a beat reporter and learned all of the rules of. He didn't go to journalism school, as far as I know. I mean, he has an incredibly, incredibly prestigious career. The kid went to college when he was twelve years old. He worked for Obama. He worked for Clinton. I think he worked for the UN. He did some humanitarian work in Africa. You know, I mean, all of this, of course, like made possible by the fact that his mother is Mia Farrow and his father is Woody Allen, and he is who he is. Um, but. He didn't like work his way up from the bottom and develop all of the skills that you might need to become a great investigative reporter. And I think that's a problem. Right. Although I will say like a lot of people who have much longer resumes, including like Cy Hirsch or Jason Leopold at BuzzFeed News, you know, there's a lot of questions about their work, too. I think like investigative reporting at the highest levels. It's just really fucking difficult to pull off. For sure. And and a lot of people criticize Ben Smith because as editor of um, – BuzzFeed, he published the Steele dossier, which ended up, you know, there's no evidence that Donald Trump was into piss parties or whatever, and published a lot of conspiracy theories about Russian interference in the election that didn't end up panning out. And I think that criticism is totally valid. Um, I also hope that Ben Smith maybe learned a little bit from it. Um, and Farrow's response to this has basically just been to deny it. I would recommend that people read the, uh, the Eric Wimple column about this in the Washington Post, which we can link to in the show notes. It's the whole thing is concerning. And but what's more concerning to me is just how many people just refuse to look at the evidence and think like Ronan Farrow is a hero. We believe Ronan Farrow. Yeah. Uh, so the other fun fact about Ronan Hero, <laughs> the other fun fact about Ronan Farrow. So I heard this, I, I heard this, um, this from a, from a, a source close to Woody Allen, uh, uh, like a year ago. And, um, and I, and I never said anything about it publicly because I, you know, couldn't corroborate it or whatever. But it, this was published in Woody Allen's recent memoir, so 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 no, I feel fine to repeat it. So Ronan Farrow was in a wheelchair for a while, and the the public story, the story that he and his family put forth, was that he caught some he caught a, a like a virus or something while he was doing humanitarian work in Africa. Well, according to Woody Allen. Um, he actually had leg lengthening surgery and you can see pictures of him from when he was like pre wheelchair and post wheelchair. And he did gain like five inches, Whoa. you know, maybe he had a late puberty in his wheelchair, but it's, it, but Woody Allen says that, um, says that he had leg lengthening surgery because his mother, Mia Farrow, um, thinks that you can't be a short politician. <laughs> Wait, so you, okay. So you heard that independently and then Woody Allen put it in its book. Yeah. Wow. So I've been skeptical of Ronan Farrow for a long time. And most of that is because of his own response to the, the controversy over his alleged father, Woody Allen. Um, and if you've seen pictures of him, you, you'll know why I say that's his alleged father. <laughs> and so, so, he, so Woody Allen, as, as probably everybody knows, was accused of, have mole of molesting his daughter, Dylan, um, when she was four years old, right? And so Allen wrote, he's, Allen has always denied this. He was investigated and cleared um, by two investigations. And he's never been accused of anything, uh, of anything remotely like that, other than the fact that he did marry his, you know, his girlfriend's adopted daughter, um, which, you know, shady as shit, and it complicates the narrative for sure. Um, but he's never been accused of any sort of wrongdoing from the like many, many women that he's worked with over his life. Um, he also has a son named Moses, who totally refutes um, the allegations that Dylan and Rodin made against, uh, against, against their father, and basically has said that Mia Farrow was abusive. Um, and so Ronan, he hates his dad, you know, and he probably has good reasons to hate his dad or alleged dad. And when his father published a memoir, he complained about it. And Hachette, his publisher, there was a big protest and they fucking they they cut his contract. They killed the book. And so to me, it's like all of the evidence, the bulk of the evidence shows that Woody Allen is not guilty of this crime, right? Like other witness statements, invest actual investigations, the fact that there's no history of this. And he has become this total pariah where most of the people in his life have written him off. You know, and I'm not a Woody Allen fan by any by any stretch of the imagination. I like 
don't like his films. But I think it's a miscarriage of justice. And so to me, the idea that Ronan Farrow is just this like golden child is just incredibly ironic if he is also instrumental in the sort of railroading of an innocent man. Yeah, I mean, to like to me, it almost doesn't matter what the evidence is. The idea that because a group of people, including employees at the publisher, which is really fucked up, are offended and pissed off that the book should just get canceled. And, and it did get, it pick, got picked up by some sort of, um, I think sort of new contrarian publisher. But I, I thought that was really disturbing, honestly, like independent of the evidence that you would just say like, well, he was accused of something, so he can't tell his side of the story. I just, I just think that's deeply anti-journalistic. Anyone involved in the publishing world should not take that position. And, not only did people take it, but they like loudly embraced it. But luckily, like there was some pushback. There were some good columns, I think, about why that shouldn't have happened. But yeah, that whole thing was pretty messed up. And the same thing is what's happening right now with Matt Lauer, with people in the media saying, we don't want to hear from Matt Lauer. I think people should have the right to defend themselves, even if they're accused of heinous crimes, especially if they're if like there's evidence that they're not guilty of those crimes. I mean, like a lot of the people saying this stuff are hacks. And I'm sure if you look back and saw how they covered the Rolling Stone case or how they covered Duke Covington or other examples. Yeah, exactly. So it just sucks that you don't really get, there's like very little professional incentive to, to approach this stuff carefully. You get a lot more points for being a, a moral crusader. And I think that's more and more the case as the industry contracts and there's like less and less, you know, bread to go around. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that it's, it's good for very few people, people's careers to do things like defend Woody Allen or Matt Lauer. Um, it's certainly not going to get you a job at most New York media outlets right now. No. I mean, it, no, it, it it legitimately feels professionally threatening to like stand up when, when in the moment during one of these blowups. And again, that's like the least of journalism's concerns. There are much bigger structural issues, but it's, you know, it's connected. Right. But right. should we move on to another extremely successful young journalist everyone is jealous of? Yeah, who also might have bad parents. <laughs> So this one concerned Gia Tolentino, who is a much beloved writer for The New Yorker. She was at Jezebel before that. She was at like the Toast or the Hairpin or something like that. Um, Also, like Ronan Farrow, is younger and more attractive and more successful than me. So I am, full disclosure, very jealous of both of them. Speak for yourself. (laughs) Yeah. So uh, Gia also had had a, a book out last year, a, a book of essays that was sort of part memoir, um, part essays, um, called Trick Mirror. And that and the New the New York City Council passed a law that you have to read this book. So I'm I'm in violation of the law that I have it. Yeah, me too. Um, although I did find a free copy online yesterday, so I might do it now. Um, so Gia Tolentino, very very well beloved in New York media. She is uh, she seems she comes across as very charming. She doesn't come across um, online at least as like a as a mean girl. She just comes across as like somebody you would want to be friends with. And I think a lot of people do want to be friends with her, um, as we learned this week. So I I have to admit, I have a little part in this controversy and one that I'm not totally proud of. Um, But about a week ago, I was looking at Gia Tolentino's Wikipedia page, and there's a, a section on it about her background that basically says that her parents were accused of alien smuggling. And um, I, I took a screenshot of that and I posted it on Twitter and I said something like, <laughs> I said something like, you know, I think it's weird that, um, that Gia, Gia Tolentino has ever written about this. And, and I, I do think it's weird. Like it is the most interesting part of her biography. I mean, her parents were accused of, of basically human trafficking and, um, and, and like there was a trial and they ended up pleading guilty to lesser charges, but we'll get into the details shortly. So, so why did I post this? Well, a couple reasons. One is that I, I genuinely find it curious that she's never written about this when she has milked many, many facets of her life for content. It just like it just if if I were the child of like human traffickers, I would I would write about it. Um, it's fascinating, uh, and so that was one reason. And then the I think. The more interesting question here isn't why didn't she write about this, but why doesn't this ever come up in interviews, right? So this is on our Wikipedia page. So this is not a secret. Um, It links to news articles about what happened. And and this has never come up in an interview with Gia Tolentino, at least never one that I've that I've read. Um, and so I find that like interesting. Like if I were going to interview Gia Tolentino and I and I and I found this out about her, I would I would ask her about it. And then the other reason I posted this is because I'm an incorrigible gossip. <laughs> And it's fucking juicy as shit. Yeah. It really is. I mean, this is like, 
a woman who has written a lot about ethics and morality, and she wrote about how she no longer shops at Amazon because of the human cost of Amazon, <laughs> and she's the child of human traffickers. What the fuck? You know, so I'm an incorrigible gossip. I'm also petty um, and jealous of her. So, like, there are some, like, duplicitous reasons here for posting this, but also a genuine curiosity about why this is not a, like, well-known part of her biography. I, li- I like the idea that it's, like, it's like a mix of, of 50% genuine curiosity and 50% personality shortcomings. <laughs> I would say 40-60, really. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, so this didn't get much traction like there was like a little bit of pushback like someone uh, I don't remember who, who this person was and she blocked me so I can't look it up but some like blue check mark um, accused uh, said something about like why are all white women like uh, obsessed with this part of, of Gia Tolentino's biography um, which I, I found interesting because I, I like I, I checked Twitter before I posted this and I hadn't seen it it might have been uh, maybe a couple people had referenced this before um, but this is not like something that white women are like as far as I know like my white women friends and I when we're like cooking Alice in Roman's cookbook we don't like get around and talk about Gia Tolentino or we, we didn't um, but we're gonna start <laughs> So I got a little bit of pushback, but they're really this like this didn't go viral. It like nobody saw it. I don't have that many followers, like pretty minor, you know, like pictures of my dog. It's get like more engagement than this we did. And then this week, so Gia Tolentino posted a blog on her website addressing not my tweet, but addressing um, the sort of, you know, the story that her parents were human traffickers. And so she begins it by saying that she was like Googling herself with her family because she wanted to show her family something from like an old article that she'd written. And she came across this, uh, she came across people talking about this in the, in the Red Scare subreddit. So Red Scare is a, a lefty sort of dirtbag left podcast. Um, and apparently this is where, this is where this, this news emerged from was, it was their subreddit. And I don't know if they have ever directly addressed it or talked about it on their podcast. But so this was really being talked about in one place, just the Red Scare subreddit. And I and I don't think the Red Scare subreddit has like hundreds of thousands of people. It just wasn't that big of a story. And this also happened like apparently this was posted in the in the subreddit like last year. So there's been several months for this to like blow up and it never had. But so she needed to for some reason, she felt like she needed to address it. Um, so she wrote a piece about uh, about her experience when her parents were accused of, of basically human trafficking or alien smuggling, um, bribery, fraud, a, an array of, of sort of white collar crimes. According to media reports at the time and court documents and witness testimony that has all now been like screenshots of which are all like floating all around Twitter. Her parents in the early 2000s, so her, her grandmother, I guess, founded an organization that was recruiting teachers from the or nurses from the Philippines to come over and work in the US during a nursing shortage. And then at some point they moved into teaching. So they would recruit these nurses to come over here and then get the uh, jobs in schools in Texas and then like win-win situation, right? They get to immigrate. These these schools get get I guess maybe there was a teacher shortage too, although I'm not sure that that's actually true. Um, you know, get this the, these staff or whatever. And then the recruiting agency would get paid. Her mother was implicated in this too, but her grandmother and her father were really sort of the main characters in this saga. And so according to news reports at the time, what prosecutors allege is that they had knowingly recruited these teachers, brought them over from Texas, promised them visas, promised them jobs, um, promised them that they would eventually be able to bring their families over here, um, you know, and live legally. And they got here, and there, for most of them, there weren't jobs. And they housed them in, uh, in sort of unfurnished, kind of squalid apartments. And they charged them, charged the teachers like $10,000, charged them really exorbitant interest rate, and they had to pay rent. They weren't allowed to find work elsewhere. According to witness statements, they all, were also told that if they complained to anybody, they would be deported. Um, and so this is what, the, this is what the, the feds accused her parents of being involved in. In her piece, she basically spun this as her parents being overcharged by the federal government because they are brown, right? So her, I guess her her dad is Filipino-Canadian. She was, I think, 
I don't know if she was born in Canada or Texas, but they're like, they're Filipino American. And it's, you know, and it's a sad story. Like apparently her dad was arrested when she was a teenager. Her parents really shielded her from everything that was going on. Her dad was put in solitary confinement. She couldn't talk to him for months. Like really sad story. It's hard not to feel a lot of sympathy for her, for her family. They, they lost all of their money. Apparently they were fairly wealthy and they lost all of their money after this. And so it's, it's really hard not to feel sympathy for this. But at the same time, this piece that she writes, and she says this is like, you know, this is because of like the Red Scare uh, subreddit and like salacious internet gossip. And she has to sort of go into this, you know, and it's going to hurt her family and she doesn't want to do this. And the reason she hasn't written about this before is because she wants to protect her family, which does sort of answer my question, like, why haven't you written this before? But what she doesn't do is at all acknowledge the complexities of what her parents are alleged to have done. So there are Dozens of witnesses, these people that they brought over from the Philippines who said they were exploited, who said that her parents were essentially loan sharks, right? So, and some of this stuff is legal, you know, and maybe it shouldn't be legal, but some of this stuff is legal. And apparently this is a really common sort of predatory scheme where you charge these immigrants exorbitant amounts of money with exorbitant interest rates and they become sort of and, and, you know, indentured to you in these ways. But she totally flattens it and makes it about, A, herself, which is fine, it's her piece, but she doesn't, like, there's this, this, this rhetoric that you hear all the time in sort of lefty media. You have to center the victim. You have to center the victim. The alleged victims of her parents make no appearance in this. No appearance, right? And so she publishes this, and the response is like, there's this flood of like elite blue check marks on Twitter. And I like, I'm a blue check mark. I like sort of hate using that term because it's so fucking stupid, but I think it does illustrate who these people are. No, Just, we're terrible. I am too. And we're terrible people. They are absolutely terrible people. They should only kick blue check marks off of Twitter. And so. There's just this flood of sympathy for her and people saying, like, solidarity. I'm so sorry you had to write this. With absolutely the same people who, under cer different circumstances, if anybody else who had written this would be fucking appalled that she wrote thousands of words and didn't mention the poor brown victims of this scheme. You know, the, the, the victims of this, of her story, were her and her parents. And I'm totally willing to believe that. They were overcharged. She wrote in the piece that her parents were facing hundreds of years in jail. So ultimately what happened with the trial is there was this long trial and then uh, with 200 witnesses and um, after and le like right before the end of the trial or right before they were, I guess, supposed to deliberate, the judge declared a mistrial because according to news reports that I saw, um, a couple of the jurors, it turned out, were like reading newspaper articles about this. And then so they ended up pleading, there was, they ended up pleading to lesser charges and getting three months of probation. Three other people um, working with the school district who were essentially alleged of taking bribes, like they were, they were getting these free trips to, uh, to the Philippines with the, with the understanding that they would, you know, hire these teachers. And then when the teachers come here, they didn't have jobs for the teachers. It, maybe it's the school district's fault that there were, that there were no jobs for the teachers. You know, uh, like I I'm totally willing to believe that it was overcharging, that there was racism involved, that her parents were victims in some way. But she had the opportunity to like actually report this out. You know, maybe she doesn't want to report it out. That's totally fine. But what I took away from her piece was just a lot of sort of, you know, self-aggrandizing and this just like absolutely no consideration for anyone but her and her family. Yeah. Well, it's also, I mean, this is another story similar to the Ben Smith, Ronan Farrow dust up where there's the story itself. And then there's a the very interesting experience of just watching professional media figures respond to it. And in this case, as you say, it's a, a, a wave of support, which I think in many ways is understandable, especially from people who know her personally or professionally. Like, I think it's human nature to want to support someone who's close to you, who's in your circles, but it's mixed with sort of a lack of any real skepticism and and i think what frustrates me about that is like many of the people offering her unbridled support are people who in other situations when the person at the center of a controversy is quote unquote bad they're very quick to pile onto them and they don't really care about contrary evidence and you know even otherwise smart people got caught up in this one of the responses that jumped out at me was from a i'm not going to name her but she's an immigration reporter i think he's a pro she's really good at what she does and her response to gia was wow, you did an amazing job with that. Like that, it was like, I couldn't have done a better job laying out an immigration story than the way you did. And then another reporter to his credit responded to that 
well, don't you think if you're actually going to report on a story like this, you would want to hear from the victims, which is like exactly right. And that's the point you made. So right, right. And I think you're right. I mean, I, like, I, like, I, there's nothing wrong with defending your friends. Not all of these people are her friends, though, because I saw like Emily Bazelon said, like, you know, I've long admired your work. And now I admire it even more now than ever. Like they're I don't think they're close personal friends. And she writes about she writes about law enforcement. So it's like she should she should be aware of overcharging, but she should also be somewhat sympathetic to victims. Right. Absolutely. And I mean, it, it seems totally plausible that both things can be true that they were in that they were overcharged and they were also engaged in a scheme that was inherently exploit exploitation you know and both things can be true but gia just doesn't at all address that and also like okay so so after this so there's this wave of of like support from blue check marks and then people are pissed off, right? And that, which was my response too. I sort of felt bad about this, you know, like I was a little bit involved in this and like, and now she has to write this thing, like excavating her pain. I felt a little bit bad for bad for her. And then I saw this wave of support from all these people, just totally credulous, just like solidarity, sister, go girl boss, you know? And so people see that and they're just fucking pissed because it, what it shows is that there is, and these are often people who sort of pose themselves as leftists, you know, as people who are talking about like unionizing their own workplaces and, and, you know, unionized BuzzFeed or Vox Media or whatever. And at the same time, totally credulous when it comes to this, the account of their friend. And so there's this wave of anger. And so it becomes a much bigger story because of all of these people sort of support her, um, which I completely understand. Because when you look at it, it's just like checkmark after checkmark after checkmark being like, yeah, sister, I love you. And so, so, so the, the tide turns now, right? And yet, if you look at, so I started to feel like even like a little bit more sorry for Gia, even though I think, I, I think this work was like totally just like flat and one sided and like, and not a reflection of like a, a deep thinker or, or a great journalist. And I should say, I also do think she's a great writer and I, I'm jealous of her because she is very good. Um, not just because of her sex, her, her success. I'm, I genuinely think she's very good at what she does. Um, you know, but I, I started to, to feel a little bit bad for her, you know, because now there's this pile on. But then I looked at, I like looked at the at the numbers today and this like pile on is still there's like 600 responses and like she's got like 15,000 likes on this post right so I don't think this is going to have any like major consequences for her professionally unlike Alice and Roman um, I don't think the New Yorker is gonna gonna do anything nobody has you know there's no think pieces about this if you had written this piece or if I had written this piece well actually if you and I had written they'd probably just ignore it but if like let's say like Barry Weiss had done something right. like this how many think pieces do you think would have been published by now just excoriating Barry for defending herself and her family and not centering the victims right. and, well, that's what... and that has not happened with Gia no and I think that that's like the one authentic response I saw from a lot of people who aren't journalists. Like, and this was people on the left, the sort of anti-identitarian left and some people on the right who are both saying like, you know, you swap out some of the names here. You have someone with like an indictment that looks that damning and, and they, you know, uh, it's exactly as you said, if this was Barry Weiss or someone who wasn't a darling of New York media, they would be absolutely pilloried it about it forever. And I think people, Consumers of journalism have accurately identified a certain disingenuousness. This is not Gia's fault. Gia should not be held responsible for stuff her parents did. Full stop. Absolutely not. And and nobody has said that. Like that. I mean, that's one thing that no. like I, I haven't seen. I did I, like obviously shit goes haywire online, and I did see people saying like your parents were slaveholders, which I think is fucked up. Like yes. it's not yeah, exactly. true. It's not true. Like she doesn't deserve this. But she also could have avoided this entirely by doing two things. One, ignoring the entire thing and it would have gone away. Or two, she could have said, I love my family and I'm not my father. That's it. That's it. Right. Yeah. It was an interesting example of, I, I think both you and I have, um, again, we're nowhere near as high profile as she is, but there have been times when people have like accused us of stuff or launched certain criticisms and you really have to think through whether it's worth responding to at all. I think there's a strong case that this... This would have been something weird lefty Twitter would have like laughed about forever either way. But by responding to it, I think she has Streisanded it a little bit. Way more people know about it. Sure, she got a wave of support, but it definitely like breathes some life into the weird left people who are who are mad about it. And like I said, I, I think some of their anger has validity to it, but I just I'm not sure this was as a case study in how to respond to controversy. I'm not sure this is an example of like a time she should have. Yeah, I would say this was this was like what not to do. Also, this was during during the George W. Bush administration, and I think um, the one like the one important point about like the justice system that I hope people don't lose sight of here is like uh, the feds like destroy people's lives, and they do 
sometimes on the thinnest slivers of evidence, like build these ridiculously over the top cases, especially in situations involving morally charged crimes like human trafficking or terrorism. Like the New Yorker did some great um, coverage of these of these cases involving Muslims and terrorism, where it's just like just bullshit, basically. So. That could be an element here. But as you, as as we were talking, like she also didn't really address the strongest parts of the complaint. Right, right. I mean, that's the thing. A lot of this shit is really, really blown up. If you read Elizabeth Nolan Brown in Reason, you'll see a lot of these stories about how charges of human trafficking or sex trafficking or whatever really get blown up by the feds. Um, you know, and also during the Bush administration when this happened, like, so post 9-11, you know, they passed the Patriot Act, they established Homeland Security, and they were having a hard time finding terrorists. So at one point, they shifted their attention and started fo- focusing on like environmental terrorists, you know, so they, many of whom they ended up prosecuting on crazy trumped up charges. This absolutely happens. And I'm totally willing to believe that's what happened with Gia's family. But she doesn't address the ethics here, the ethics of this sort of inherent exploitation where you're going to charge, uh, you know, someone poor $10,000 to come to the U.S. and then charge them, you know, charge them rent and then charge, a, you know, an exorbitant interest rate. Um, it's just and, and that's that's even legal. You know, I mean, the, the, the things that were illegal here wasn't actually the exploitation. It was like failure to report. Um uh, you know, fraud. Um, you know, there are th- these schemes are like, unfortunately, some of them, there are loopholes that make them legal, even if they're ex- exploitative. But so even if they didn't violate the law in some of these cases, that doesn't mean they didn't, what they didn't do wasn't fucked up. And she just doesn't acknowledge that. So I mean, I would love to see her actually report this out. You know, I think she's a great writer. And I think she could do a great job if she actually did it. Um, she ends her piece saying she, she wants to do that, like under a different administration, which I'm I'm not sure, like, she can't report under the Trump administration? Yeah, I didn't. Uh, well, either way, some conservative journalist is definitely going to beat her to it because this story is just sitting right out there. And she literally gave it to them. It's a weird situation. It is. I do feel a little bit bad about my tweet. A little bit. Because I wonder if that had anything to do with it. But also, like, she didn't need to do this. Girl, you... <laughs> you can feel a little bit bad about it. But, like, the next time there's some dumb Covington blow up, you will be there defending someone who deserves to at least be heard out so like you're uh, you're operating on both sides of the ledger in other words well I, I'll, I'll take that yeah i mean it's on our fucking wikipedia page come on have you ever done any of the um the human, human trafficking? trafficking well you know i am uh, the leader of an international group of powerful lesbians <laughs> and we've come full circle oh man this has been such a brutal week for media news Dude. like both these stories just like Dude. they highlight everything horrible about our world and also our own narcissism because like these are these are stories about and I'm I'm pointing the finger squarely at myself here but these are stories about like sexual abuse and power and human trafficking and I'm like let's see what the blue check marks are doing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, ultimately none of this shit is really important, but that's what we're here to talk about. We don't need everybody doesn't need to hear the important shit. It can't be pandemic all the time. Exactly. And also like if our Patreon doesn't, you know, start really picking up we're gonna have to do human trafficking just to stay alive anyway so it's all connected i'm just gonna get my minions to give me their money i guess that's what our patreon is really well okay was there anything else we wanted to discuss or is that it for the app i feel uh, i feel emotionally exhausted from this this episode me too there's just so much it's just so much like it's so much punching up it's just exhausting the good news is we're about to record a very very silly and stupid patrons only episode so that'll maybe that'll recharge us a little bit join uh join at patreon.com slash blocked and reported is that what it is yep that is the name of our podcast katie thank you for (laughs) noticing (laughs) okay i think we're done we're done i'm jesse single and remember if your parents do human trafficking make sure to drag them on twitter about it and i'm katie herzog and also remember if you ever need a wife just ask julie bendel